Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and in particular, thank you to Max for organising everything. It's been fantastic. It's, it's great, and it's great to see everybody here. I wasn't entirely sure what I should be talking about, apart from ironic liquids, of course, but, um, but I will do my best to, 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 to map it to the... Oh, dear, that's interesting. So I'm going to talk about uh, ironic liquids, but first, the, this is a, a picture of Queen's. This is not where Joanne and I work, actually, unfortunately. We live in, a live, live in a building up the road, which is built in about 1950. But this is a building from about 1850. Uh, so this is the, the main administration building of, uh, of, of the university. So I'm going to talk a bit about... Ionic liquids, I believe that there are some people in the audience who don't know what ionic liquids are, so I'll talk a little bit about ionic liquids in general, then about functionalizing those ionic liquids, and, and then some ideas about whether or not you can consider these ionic liquids uh, in the context of green chemistry, uh, and then have a little bit of an outlook and a, and a particular application that uh, has been achieved within the department. So they're not new, is the first thing to say. Um, Conventionally, the first report is thought to be in about 1914 with uh, the uh, Wald Walden's appreciation that um, whoops, Walden's appreciation that the nitrate salts of ammonium-based uh, uh, materials were liquid at room temperature. Now, these might have been wet, but actually they've been shown to also have a melting point close to room temperature. And so these were reported as the first ionic liquids, although they weren't called ionic liquids, of course, at that time. Um, it, was, it was just a molten salt of some description. Not only were they not new in 1914, but they're not new in terms of a material to be used in chemical applications. So conventionally, they, the, the history of ionic liquids is thought to be Okay, 1914, Walden discovered the, the nitrate salts of, of ammonium materials. And then they went through to the 1950s and 60s where they were used as, as materials for, um, for electrochemistry. But they, they're thought not really to have had a, a large industrial application until much later than that. But actually, this is a process that Eastman Chemicals uh, were using in, in the 1980s and 1990s. They took a epoxy butene and made, they were making 2,5-dihydrofuran. And you can see here that they've used a phosphonium salt as the ionic liquid. In fact, it's the phosphonium iodide, I think, in this particular case. And this was uh, f first commissioned in 1996 and actually ended in 2004. And so these ionic liquids have been utilised, although, again, this was not called an ionic liquid at that particular time. It was just a salt that was being used. And so the isomerization of epoxybutene is a very large-scale production uh, of materials using ionic liquids as the basis of that material. Now, of course, this is the type of thing that we associate with molten salts. We've got molten cryolite on the left-hand side, and this is being uh, used to make uh, uh, aluminium. And so this is occurring at 900 Celsius. It's a sodium-aluminium phosphide, and so, uh, sorry, a fluoride, rather. And so this is a, called a molten salt. And this is at room temperature. This is butyl methyl imidazolium tetrafluoroborate. The question is... How do you get from one to the other? So this is the conventional material, like sodium chloride would be, but we have a material now that allows us to have a, a liquid at room temperature. And the one on the right, of course, is called the ionic liquid. So we do that by conventionally dropping the melting point. If we have small charged spheres together, then they have strong Coulombic interactions, of course. As we increase the, uh, the charge separation by making one of the ions much bigger than the other one, of course, then we reduce the Coulombic interaction. If we reduce the Coulombic interaction, we reduce the lattice energy. If we reduce the lattice energy, we reduce the melting point. And that's seen, of course, as you go from sodium chloride to bromide to iodide and so on. But you can also do things with packing. So if we conventionally take a material that is made up of triangles and a material that is made up of, of, of spheres, we can pack both of these into a reasonably close-packed orientation. And so the closer we can get these atoms or ions together, the stronger the Coulombic interaction will be. How if we start mixing the triangles and the spheres together, of course, the spaces in between them get larger. They're forcing the ions apart. Again, you drop the melting point. 
So the combination of large spheres or large ions, which are asymmetric and don't pack very well, gives us the opportunity to reduce the melting point, of course. And so these are the types of materials that you make low melting point ionic liquids from. And so you can see on the left-hand side, we've got an ammonium-based system, which has these large alkyl chains on them, even though what we've got is we've got a chloride anion, which is relatively small. On the right-hand side, we have an imidazolium-based system where we've delocalized the charge in the imidazolium-based system, and therefore the point charge associated with the, with the, uh, with the uh, cation is much more diffuse and therefore interacts much less with the chloride anion. And you can tell that by having a little bit of a look at where the, <coughs> the charge density looks like in terms of those materials, as you can see here. We can also have much larger anions than chloride. We've already looked at uh, tetrafluoroborate, which is the one on the top left, but hexafluorophosphate. And this one here is used a great deal in the literature, bistriflamide, and that's because it delocalizes the charge. The negative charge is spread over the molecule, and then, therefore, if you've got a charge that is spread, you don't have a stronger interaction between the anion and the cation. And again, you can see the size of these molecules that we're talking about in these particular cases. And you can see in this particular case, for example, this phosphonium system with a very, very long chain alkyl where you're not getting very good packing. Although in that particular case, as we'll see in a moment, you can start to get different effects occurring as you change the alkyl chain links. So just to give you some basic nomenclature, <coughs> this is an imidazolium cation with a PF6 Anion, we call this 1-butyl-3-methyl-imidazolium hexafluorophosphate, or C4-MIM, with this being the C4 part, or B-MIM being the butyl-MIM PF6. But of course, there is a large number of those materials. We can go for things that, again, have delocalized charges, like the pyridinium cations on the left-hand side, the pyrrolidinium systems in the middle, where the charge is more centered on the nitrogen, and then we have the conventional ammonium and phosphonium systems, as we can see here, with the uh, tetraalkyl groups on them. But again, you have a large range of anions possible as well. So to give you an idea, there are about a 10 million simple ionic liquids. Therefore, this gives you a much wider range of solvent choices than you have with organic or molecular solvents available to you. And just giving you a simple table gives you some idea. You can change the chain length, on the left-hand side, this is just one of the alkyl chains, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We can change the anion from chloride to the, uh, to the uh, aluminium chloride system, to the PF6, to the BF4, bistriflamide, and so on. And you can see there's a large range just by looking at those relatively simple anions and cations. And of course, if you start mixing these ionic liquids, they're still ionic liquids, but you start to increase their, the number of those properties, the number of the ionic liquids that you've got available to you. And of course, if you've got one million simple ionic liquids, that means you have one billion binaries or one trillion ternaries. And so the range is enormous. The difficulty is how do you choose which ionic liquid you should use for which application? And of course, that is the, the million dollar question, which I think will be answered tomorrow in the workshop. So there'll be, there are databases available which correlate physical properties and chemical properties of these ionic liquids with the structure of the materials. So how do these properties vary? So let's just take melting point as the, as the one option. So what we have is we have, again, the imidazolium PF6 with an alkyl group on here. And what we're going to be looking at is how the melting point changes with that alkyl group. What you can see here, as we start off with a methyl group on this end, or a butyl group, or sorry, an ethyl group on this end, we have an ionic liquid that melts above room temperature. As soon as we start to go to the butyl, we're starting to get a, a melting point around about zero degrees. As we go to the hexyl and the octyl, they're now well below zero degrees. But a strange thing then starts to happen. As we then increase the alkyl chain further to C10, then to C12, and so on, we start to get more and more higher melting point 
materials until a point where they're above room temperature and we start to form a liquid crystalline phase. And so now what we've got is a domination by packing rather than a domination by the Coulombic interactions. And so we get liquid crystalline behavior. And of course, you can get the crystal structure of those materials, as you can see here, where we have alkyl-alkyl interactions as well as the Coulombic interactions. And these give rise to smectic liquid crystals in general, as you can see from the polarizing optical microscopy. And so the, it's not just the Coulombic interactions that dominate the structure. As you change the functionality, as you change the alkyl chain length on the cation, you also can change the, the, the structure of the materials as well. And so you can get fully functional designer solvent type media. So this is a generic structure of an ionic liquid for dimethyl imidazolium chloride. But of course, we can change that. We can change this alkyl group, we can change this alkyl group, not just for alkyl groups, and we can also change the anion, of course, as we've seen already. So this gives you an, uh, uh, an example of a, uh, of a material that Jim Davis produced in, uh, about back in 1998 using this antifungal drug, uh, uh, myconazole. So what you've then got is you've tailored the material with a PF6 to have a, t have a tethered uh, antifungal drug. This is now being used, or these, not this particular one, but these are now being used as pharmaceutical type materials that could perhaps be replacements for drugs and get away from some of the patents that, are, that the drug companies have. We can also change the anion, of course, and in this particular case what we have is a long chain fatty acid like anion that we can get from natural products. And so we can make the material to suit what we want to be able to do. Now, of course, what we talked about is materials that are, in general, what we want is materials that are, in general, liquid at room temperature. And, of course, we know that liquids don't have long-range order compared with solids. But do they actually have structure in these types of materials? Well, this is uh, the very earliest neutron scattering pattern of what was uh, molten sodium chloride, and this was taken in 1975 by John Enderby. And what you can see is a G of R. So this G of R is a radial distribution function as a function of the distance away from the, from the central atom that you're looking at. So the way, you're, the way you should look at this is you're going to be sitting here and you're going to be looking out into the sea of anions and cations, in the case of sodium chloride, and seeing where those, where those anions and cations are sitting relative to your position. And the first thing you notice is that you're surrounded by chlorides, not surprisingly. Those chlorides sit at around about 2.5 angstroms. And then if you go a bit further out, in terms of spheres, what you then see is you see, if you're sitting on a sodium, you then see a, a whole sea of sodium ions. And those sodium ions sit at around about 4.2, 4.3 angstroms. Those sodium ions then sit where the, cation, where the anions of the chloride do not sit. In other words, you have the peak of the chloride, then you have the peak of the sodium, and it's in the hollow of the anions. The next thing you see as you, sit, as you look a bit further out is you then see some chlorides, and hence you get another peak, which happens to be twice the distance of the first peak that you see. So these are, then you see some sodiums, as you can see here, and then you see some chlorides, and then you see some sodiums, and it gradually smears out. But you can see that it's reasonably well ordered. You can see even out to sort of 14, 15 angstroms, you're still seeing the oscillating structure of anions and cations, anions and cations. And so this, was the, this, is, this is much more ordered than things like, for example, hexane would be. So this is molten sodium chloride. Does the same thing occur for ionic liquids? Well, of course it does, because you're dominated in general by the, uh, by the Coulombic interactions. So this is data that we've taken over the last 10 years. This is work that uh, John Holbury and myself and uh, uh, Tristan Youngs, for example, has been, have been taking. And so what we've been looking at, for example, is we've taken 1,3-dimethylamidazolium 
uh, salts, and we've taken the chloride, we've taken the PF6, and we've taken the bistriflamide salts, and we've looked at both the G of R's as well as the spatial distributions. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is you're seeing where the anions are sitting in each of those cases with respect to where a cation sits. So if we, look, if we remember back to the sodium chloride, so we've got a chloride here with this instead of the sodium as the cation, we sit here and we look out, well, hey, presto, we've got a nice sharp peak associated with the chloride. That chloride is sitting at around about four and a half angstroms. If you remember back to the sodium chloride case, it was about 2.3 angstroms. And so what we've got is we've got a big bulky cation. We've moved our chloride away because of the size of the cation. We see another feature sitting around about nine angstroms, twice the distance, as we saw with the sodium chloride, but we're seeing reasonable amounts of order. What we see in the PF6 is exactly the same thing. We see a feature here and then a feature here. This triflamide shows you exactly the same thing. So the anion, and if you calculate the numbers of anions by looking at the integration under this peak, the anions in that first shell more or less sit exactly the same place in each of these cases. There's a slight difference depending on, depending on the size of the anion. As you can see here, the bistriflamide, which is large and bulky, sits around about 5 angstroms, whereas this one sits around about 4.3. What about the cations? Well, again, you're going to be sitting on the DMIM cation here, and you're looking out. What you see is a feature here, which sits around about here. Again, you've got a feature here which sits around about here. And again, you can see the shift where the second feature here is sitting here, slightly further away from where the, where the, uh, where the, uh, where, for the bistriflamide case than it is for the chloride case. So we have structure in our ionic liquid as well. Can you look at the spatial distributions? Well, this gives you a bit more information. The G of R's gives you distances. It will give you coordination numbers. But the spatial distributions start to indicate whereabouts these anions and these cations start to interact with each other. That's important because where they interact, especially if you have something that's a functional material, starts to then influence about how reactivity occurs within those materials. So what we've got in the top line here is we've got where the anions are sitting relative to the cation in terms of their spatial position. What we have in the bottom line is where the cations in the second shell sit with respect to that central cation. So what we see is we, that we see that we're dominated in the chloride case by the chlorine associated with that C2 position in between the two methyl groups here and here. That's not so surprising because that C2 position is the most acidic position that we have. It being the most acidic position, it's got the strongest hydrogen bond with the chloride. Great. As we start to move to PF6, however, what we still see is we still see a small amount of interaction here. So we have some hydrogen bonding, although it's much weaker with PF6. Most of the PF6 has now moved to above and below the ring. When we go to bistriflamide, which is the least strongly hydrogen bonding material, or anion, we see nothing above the C2 position, and everything is around the center of that material. So we have now changed our accessibility of this C2 proton. If we change the accessibility of that C2 proton, we change its acidity, we change its uh, interaction with other molecules, uh, its ability to dissolve water, etc., etc. So it's very different. What is also interesting is what happens with a cation. If you look where the cation sits in the chloride, there's not really any spatial discrimination. It just sits everywhere. As soon as the anion starts to get larger, though, it now starts to penetrate a little bit into the cation shell, and therefore you see mutual exclusivity between where the PF6s are sitting and where the cations are sitting. And that's even more strongly pronounced in the case where the bistriflamide is. So again, this gives you some information about what happens. Of course, just looking at the structure of the material in that way doesn't give you everything that you want to know. If you come to the workshop tomorrow, then you'll see Joanne may pre present some data on gas solubility. Are you giving 
Yeah? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Good. He is now anyway. <laughs> and so one of the things that you have to take into account in these cases when you're trying to measure or try and predict things like solubility is you've got to not just look at an iron pair. What we know from these materials is that they are a sea of cations and anions. So just considering an iron pair does not give you how the organization of the material will change as you dissolve something in it. You have to look at a shell of six to eight coordinations of, sodium, of, of anions around a cation, 12 or 15 coordinations of a cation, or whatever it might be. Not only that, but you have to look at how the molecules distribute themselves in terms of their conformations. So this is the bistriflamide system. Bistriflamide is used a great deal. Everyone draws it um, in, in one particular form, which in general is drawn in this form here. And in crystal structures, if you look at it, 99% of crystal structures also have it in the trans form. However, there are some that have it in the cis form. And that's to do with packing, it's to do with interactions, of course. So you have, you have not only conformations of the anion, but you also have conformations of the cation. If I have a very long chain, an alkyl chain on, sitting on my cation, I can have the Gaussian transforms of those as well. So, so again, the conformations will determine the solubility. In this particular case, however, what we have is a distribution. In the crystal structure, we have one or the other. In the liquid, though, we have free rotation about those bonds. And so what we notice is that you do have weaker amounts of the cis form of the bistriflamide compared with the trans, but there's still a significant amount there. It's around about 30, 25 to 30% of your bistriflamide anions that are in the cis form. If you start to do predictions of gas solubility, for example, using this, and you don't take into account the cis-trans conformers, you get the answer wrong. So you have to take into account the structure of the material, which is why it's interesting to understand how these structures in the ionic liquids work. And of course, we're not just interested, of course, in the liquid structure itself. We're interested in how things dissolve. And one of the interesting things is that benzene dissolves extremely well in most ionic liquids. The question is why? Okay, so if we look at benzene, so what we've done is we've dissolved benzene in this dimethylamidazolium PF6 ionic liquid, and we've looked at its structure, not only the structure of the ionic liquid, but also the structure of the benzene. So this is at around about 30 mole percent benzene. The first thing you notice is that it, when you look at the anion distribution, nothing has happened. It sits exactly where it was before, which is what you would expect, because actually that's a very strong Coulombic interaction, which is dominated by the charge density. However, as soon as you start to look at the cation, the second shell, you start to see very different things happening. So no longer have you got this spatial distribution, you now have this spatial distribution. So it's absolutely changed in configuration. You can also look at how the ions are distributed around the benzene molecule, which then starts to give you a hint why that has changed so much. Well, the benzene has electron density above and below the ring, which is where the cations sit, of course. The anions don't like to sit where the cations are because there's steric hindrance, and so they sit around the outside in the first shell, hydrogen bonding, or perhaps not hydrogen bonding, to the carbon hydrogens within the system. But they're sitting in the mutually exclusive positions, as we saw before, for the imidazolium PF6 systems. In the second shell, however, everything changes, because now what we want is we want an interaction of the anions with the cations, and we want an interaction of the cations with the anions. And so in the second shell, the cations sit around the outside with the anions sitting in the middle, which is where you, can see the, uh, uh, where you can see the holes here. And we have the opposite occurring with the anions. The anions sit above and below, which is interacting with the cations, which are sitting here and here. And so now we've got an idea about the structure of the material and why the benzene dissolves so well. And it's because they, the benzene has a very strong interaction 
with the ionic liquid through this, uh, through this charge density. Okay, so now we have a material that is structured. We can change its interactions of the anion and the cation depending on the, depending on the structure of the material. We can change, therefore, the solvation properties. But we do need to know something about, obviously, the, the, the structure of the material to be able to understand what's going on. But are they green? So this is the definition of green chemistry. Green chemistry is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and or generation of hazardous substances. Okay, so the answer to the question is not always. They can be, but not always. You've got to design your process right. So let's have a look at the 12 green principles. They prevent waste. We've got to use renewable feedstocks and increase energy efficiency. So this, apart from the Eastman process, has been the biggest touted industrial process using ionic liquids, although in this particular case it uses an ionic liquid to be able to recycle an amine material. So what BASF have done is they've taken this uh, uh, phosph phosphine chloride material, they react it with an alcohol to form uh, this material that they then use as photoinitiators. They use the ionic liquid that is generated because they use a base which is the imidazole, they use the ionic liquid that's generated to be able to recycle. Now, hopefully the video will work. This, is given, this was given to me by BASF. So what you see to start with is the conventional process. And the conventional process does not use imidazole as the base to neutralize the hydrogen chloride. It uses this amine here. Whoops, it's all gone. This amine here, which is just, a, uh, which is just triethylamine. So they stick in the alcohol. This is rather a slow video, I have to say. I have actually shortened it. But <laughs> they then take in the amine and they stir it. And what you gradually see is when they add in the, uh, the, the phosphine material, what you start to see is a precipitation of the ammonium chloride material that comes out. It's okay there to start with. As the reaction proceeds, though, it becomes this very viscous material, which you're going to then have to try and separate, phase separate the product from the ammonium chloride. And you can see that's rather tricky to do, perhaps. Okay. So what happens when you use imidazole instead? Well, this is the material. Basically, what happens is because you're generating an ionic liquid rather than a solid now, they basically just phase separate. You get two layers. The top layer is your material that you're interested in. The bottom layer is the ionic liquid, I think, in this particular case. And then you just decant off the ionic liquid. Once you've decanted off the ionic liquid, you can then recycle. They do it by, a, I think, a thermal decomposition, although that's never been made clear. You have a, a recycle of that imidazole, and it goes back round and round and round. One of the good things for BASF, of course, is they make methyl imidazole. So this plant and the methyl imidazole plants sit side by side, and so it's not very expensive for them to do. But you can see the difference in the space-time yields. It went from 8 kilograms per meter cube per hour to 690,000. And that was simply by changing the way that the phase behavior occurred. Not only did you get better mixing, as you saw it was a very, very sticky solid, so you got better mixing and therefore you got better reaction, but you also got a much easier separation. So in this particular case, the ionic liquid is an initiator for green chemistry. We've done something similar, and this was work done by Angela McKeown and Stuart Forsyth with myself and David Rooney, where we were trying to make this fungicide, fenpropimorph, and we were using proline, or proline oxide for, for our, uh, our, our catalyst. So we did an aldol condensation, followed by a reductive amination. And the general way that you then remove the catalyst is you have to do a distillation. But because we had the ionic liquid present, we had an ionic liquid present in all of these cases, it held on to the base catalyst. And you, what you saw was fenpropimorph, the water, and the ionic liquid all phase separating from each other. The fenpropimorph was as, was as pure as it would have been if you distilled it. There was no change in the in the HPLC uh, of, the, of the material, and you just decant off the water and the ionic liquid and just recycle. And the ionic liquid contains the, contains the base as the catalyst, 
and that's just able to be then recycled into the material, dried with a low, en low energy workup. But in this particular case, what we did was we used a very, very small amount of ionic liquid so as to only do the extraction or only do the, uh, the support, the stabilization of the catalyst. So we were in a, in a pot of about a litre, we were only using three or four millilitres of ionic liquid in that system. It was simply there so that you could actually do the phase separation. One of the other cases from green chemistry is, of course, can you use biorenewable feedstocks? Well, this material here is choline chloride. This is actually chicken feed, and it's as cheap as chicken feed because it actually is it. Okay, so it's, it's pretty cheap. So you can make an ionic liquid. You can, of course, exchange it, and you can put an amino acid on it. So this is now a fully biorenewable feedstock-derived ionic liquid that potentially, I guess, chickens could eat if they really wanted to. Okay, what about the processing of bio feedstocks? Well, it's all been very well documented that ionic liquids can, can process cellulose very easily. BASF, again, uh, along with Robin Rogers, uh, generated a process for cellulose processing. It was to replace the viscose rayon process. So the green chemistry principle here is, can we replace steps in, the vis in, in a particularly bad process, in this particular case the viscose rayon one, with an ionic liquid system? And what you see here is you go from aqueous sodium hydroxide to try and get the cellulose into solution, then you use this lovely solvent carbon disulfide, and then you take another aqueous sodium hydroxide, and then you acidify. So you're doing base acid using particularly horrible things like, uh, like, the, like the carbon disulfide, simply to get the cellulose from crystalline cellulose in wood pulp into fibers. That's all you've done. You've not really changed it at all. You've just changed its structure slightly. Can you use ionic liquids? Well, this is, the, this is, a, a, this is actually not from Queens. This is a, a picture that John took when he was in Alabama. So this is a piece of filter paper being put into hot <coughs> beamim chloride. And it dissolves pretty well. Okay, so that beamim chloride is sitting at around about uh, 100 Celsius, and the and although you can't see it very easily, this is then actually a, a, a transparent material. Essentially, to get that cellulose out, you simply add water, and when you add the water, the cellulose precipitates. If you can control the way that the cellulose precipitates, you can make fibers, you can make sheets, and so on and so forth. So it's a much simpler way of actually doing this processing than actually having the sodium hydroxide and the, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, and the sulfuric acid treatments. But again, what we were interested in was how does this cellulose dissolve? So although we couldn't look at cellulose itself, cellulose looks a little bit like glucose, or glucose looks a little bit like cellulose. What we also know is that cellulose dissolves better in the acetate-based ionic liquids than it does in the chloride-based ionic liquids. So what we did was we did some neutron scattering, and had a look at how glucose dissolves in these materials to give us an idea about how the cellulose might dissolve in both acetate and in the chloride-based materials. So we took the ethyl, methyl, and acetates, and we dissolved quite a bit of glucose in those. So we had a 6 to 1 ratio of the ionic liquid to glucose. And what you can see to start with is if you look at the G of R's, the dashed lines here are for the mixture of the glucose and the acetate, and the solid lines are for the pure material. And, okay, there's some subtleties there, but really, there's not a lot of difference. So we're not really changing the structure of the ionic liquid at all. So why does the glucose dissolve? Well, we can then start to look at it in a bit more detail. What we can do is we can sit on an acetate here, for example, and we can look out and look out for the individual hydroxyls on the glucose. And we have a number of them. We have five. We have some associated with the ring and some associated with the terminal hydroxyl, a primary one. <clears throat> and what you see 
is you see a strong interaction here. And if I do the integration, what I get is just over one hydroxyl per acetate molecule. And so the coordination number is approximately six for the acetates. I can do the same thing for the chlorides. And what you notice is, if I again look at my materials here, some of them have this band here. So I'm sitting on the chloride, looking out for the hydroxyls. Some of them have this band here, and some of them don't, as you can see from this one here. OK. Again, I can do the integration of this peak, and I get to 3.86. So I now have a coordination number of, of two less, or just over two less, for the chloride compared with the, with the acetate. If I start to look at the structures of those materials, though, well, what you find in the chloride cases, it forms these bifurcated, in these cases here, bifurcated chlorides with the hydroxyls. And then you have a terminal hydroxyl here. And so there's no, there's, this is the reason why the coordination number is less than it is with the acetates. In the case of the acetates, you form one acetate here, one acetate here, one acetate here, and one acetate here, and one here. So does this give us a hint why the chloride allows us to dissolve less cellulose, or less efficiently dissolve the cellulose, compared with the acetates? Well, we have a model. Because the chloride will bridge between fibers, effectively what you're doing when you're dissolving the cellulose in the ionic liquid is you're trying to break these fibers apart. So this fiber originally will hydrogen bond to this fiber. You need to insert something in between to be able to break them apart. When you have the chloride there, although it forces the fibers to be apart from each other, they will cause some bridging across the fibers. In the acetate case, that doesn't occur. What you get is this sort of feature occurring with the methyl group sitting down, and that forces the fibers further apart and doesn't keep them together. And hence why you get stronger cellulose dissolution in the acetate than you do in the chloride case. OK. So for a green chemistry, we also need to be able to have efficient synthesis of the ionic liquids. And this is, the, this is a conventional way that you would do the synthesis of ionic liquids. You would take a base, in this particular case methylamidazole, you would react it with an alkyl halide, and you would make the halide-based ionic liquid. And of course, this is A plus B going to C, so there's no waste. So this is perfectly green. Everything that you put in went to the product, so this is atom efficient. The trouble is that this only really makes a very, very small amount of ionic liquids. You can make things like alkyl sulfates this way. You can make chlorides this way. But that's about it. You can make, perhaps make the carbonates as well. This is the conventional way that you then further make the ionic liquids into other things. So you've made your halide-based ionic liquid, and then you have to do a metathesis step, or you do an acid-base reaction to make your material, so it may be the bistriflamide, for example, here, or whatever it might be that you want to make, but you form a mole of waste for every mole of ionic liquid that you form. And so it's not a particularly atom-efficient process to make the ionic liquids. The critical thing then is that because the production of the ionic liquid is not particularly green, you must recycle the ionic liquid. If you cannot recycle the ionic liquid, you're actually causing more of a problem with waste than you had to, done to start with. So you have to be able to show that you can recycle the ionic liquid. And the problem is also you've got a lot of workup stages to go through aqueous washing, and you've got workup stages to do with uh, organic washing and so on. And in particular, if you want to remove all of your chloride so that you have a chloride-free ionic liquid, because, for example, in catalysis, you don't want halides to be around because they can poison metal sites. If you do have that situation, then you've got to do an awful lot of washing to get that halide away from you. So let's carry on with the 12 green principles. Designer of safer chemicals and products. Designer of less hazardous chemical syntheses. Okay. 
So, are ionic liquids toxic? Yes, is the answer. You can see here, this is for imidazolium-based ionic liquids again, as a function of the alkyl chain length and as a function of the anion. And what you see here is the, as the ionic liquid alkyl chain length increases, the toxicity of that material will increase as well. You can see up the side four separate organic materials, organic solvents that are typically used in their sorts of toxicity. And you can see that methanol is way above where most of these ionic liquids are in terms of it being less toxic. But toluene, benzene, and, and chloroform are certainly well within that, within that range. And so these, are, these materials are toxic. The, uh, the alkyl chain length uh, causes a problem with toxicity because those alkyls can then penetrate the membranes. But you can use this to your advantage as well because you can use this in enzyme catalysis to be able to penetrate through the membranes of the enzymes and therefore have different, um, different efficacies for reactions. We've done this for dehydrogenation reactions where you've been able to increase the efficiency of the enzyme by giving it a little bit of a toxic shock, effectively. But you can also make them as safe or as dangerous, as it says on the slide, as you wish them to be. So this is VX nerve agent. Okay, not particularly nice. You can make that, although I'm not entirely sure that anybody has done this, into the cyanide-based ionic liquid. So you've not only got a nerve agent, but you've got a cyanide anion as well. That's presumably not very nice material. However, you can also make it from hydrazine and TNT. So this one would be quite explosive, I guess. Or you can make it from choline and ascorbic acid. So this one perhaps you could eat. So you can go from everything from explosive to a poison to something that I'm not suggesting you could eat this. Please don't go away and eat that. But anyway, potentially you could eat that. What about the minimization of accidents? Okay. One of the green principles to do with ionic liquids that is touted an awful lot is that they are not volatile. And therefore, they don't produce any VOCs. This is a good thing, of course. But it also means that you have to design your process completely differently than you would do with an organic solvent. In this particular case, it shows you the distillation rates of a number of ionic liquids associated with bistriflamide and metazolium salts. And you can see that per hour, you're getting sort of in this particular case, what is that, 24 milligrams per hour out of this thing, or no, 240 milligrams per hour, sorry, out of this thing. Okay, so you've got very low distillation rates, even at 300 degrees Celsius. However, in a conventional process, the way that you would operate is you would take your reaction, you would take your solvent, you would run your reaction, and then to purify your material at the end, you would evaporate or distill off your solvent leaving behind your material that you want to, to then use. If you can't distill your solvent, you have a problem. So now you're being asked to either doing liquid-liquid extraction, or you're going to have to distill your product away from your ionic liquid. And so the process design here is now very different from what you would have had conventionally. They can be used as embalming fluids. This is some work that was done quite a long time ago now, 2003, by Pernac, where they were using uh, the ionic liquids to, to replace formalin. Formalin is very toxic, of course, but the ionic liquids can be used in that particular case as embalming fluids. I thought that was quite interesting. Okay. They can also be used as flame retardants. So this, uh, this piece of filter paper has been coated in this ionic liquid here. In fact, this is actually very well known because those types of ionic liquids are used conventionally as flame suppressants in furniture and so on. We've got a blow torch that is actually hitting the, uh, the material. Um, the postdoc was extremely persistent at trying to actually get this thing to burn, I have to say. Eventually the cork on the, uh, on the retort stand actually then burnt. So let me... Uh, they can also be used 
as organic dispersants, and if you do that, they become quite flammable. This is a, a video from John Wilkes in the US Air Force. That's an ionic liquid being dripped onto a filament. So whilst that particular ionic liquid, if I go back, that particular ionic liquid is the same ionic liquid that was used with the blowtorch, if you get it in its right form, of course, it will burn very easily. They also can be used as explosives. You can see this one here, the imidazolium nitrate, methyl imidazolium nitrate, um, causes, uh, as you increase the temperature, causes then a rapid increase in temperature at a particular point. That then allows you to have an explosive, and now there are, there are now green explosives that will not that will not provide, not give you very much residue and will also not be terribly percussive either. So let's go on to the next part. Safer solvents and reaction conditions, maximizing atom efficiency or used in catalysis. So this is some work that we did, uh, we've been doing over the last, uh, I suppose, eight or nine years, where we've been trying to understand how ionic liquids operate with solvents and solutes but also to see whether they could do things that other, other organic solvents couldn't do. And so what you're going to see is a video on the right-hand side of phosphorus trichloride dissolving in an ionic liquid, but also into an organic solvent. So we have an ionic liquid, and you'll see at the moment that the, the, the PCL3, which is in the syringe, is just dripped into the ionic liquid, and it's very, not, not very particularly interesting. And that's what happens in THF. Now, the THF is wet, but the ionic liquid is also wet. The water content of the ionic liquid is 10 mole percent. Okay, so it really is very wet. So you've got one water molecule for every 10 iron pairs, of course. The THF is drier than that, but yet there was no reaction with the ionic liquid, but there was quite a large reaction with the THF, or the water in the THF. And you can do that over a concentration range of 0.26 molar to 26 molar PCL3. So what actually happens? Well, because the ionic liquid is very, very strongly hydrogen bonding to the water, what you get is the same sorts of things as you would do with dry steam. Conventionally, if you put water in an organic material, so this is the structure of water, this is the structure of methanol, what you get is you get clusters of water which are then interacting with the, hydro the hydroxyls of the methanol, and you're left with a hydrophobic pocket around the outside. And of course, as we go from methanol to ethanol, the interactions of the, uh, these alkyl groups increase, and therefore the size of the cluster increases. As we go from there to isopropanol to tertiary butanol, of course tertiary butanol and water don't mix. And so that's why you that happens. The alkyl group interactions are too strong in that case. But what we have is we have clustering of water. If you've got clustering of water, you've set up H3O+, plus, you've set up OH-. Minus. OH- minus is much more nucleophilic than the H2O is, and therefore it will react with the PCL3 in THF, because you set up these clusters in THF. In the case of the ionic liquid, however, the, uh, the water molecules, even at 10 mole percent, are isolated. They are hydrogen bonding strongly to the cation or to the anion, and so they are separated from each other. If you have, don't have the water molecules attached to each other, they don't form H3O+, they don't form OH-. Therefore, that water molecule is much, much less reactive than it would be in this particular case here, hence why you don't get any reaction with PCL3. Of course, as you get to more and more water molecules, they start to cluster. But that clustering doesn't really take place until about 25 mole percent. That's a huge amount of water that you've got in these systems. But you can use that to your advantage. One of the things that a colleague of mine, Marie McGough, was interested in is being able to form these molecules here. And so what we did was we took PCL3, we reacted it with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with morpholine here, We've then reacted the morpholine again to make this uh, dimorpholonium uh, phosphine chloride. Okay. If you do make it, in the, if you want to add just one of these morpholines onto here, 
you can just add a one-to-one -one mixture of the, ionic of, the, of the base, the morpholine, to the PCL3 in the ionic liquid, and you will get 99% of this. If you do that in an organic solvent, you will get some of this as well. And that's, again, because of the structuring of the ionic liquid. The PCL3 interacts with the ionic liquid. The morpholine interacts with the ionic liquid. They interact very close together, but you do, don't get two morpholines interacting with the ionic liquid at the same point, and hence why you only get this material being formed. In the organic solvent, you get clusters of morpholine. Again, those clusters of morpholine then interact with the PCL3, and you get the dimorpholonium material as well. This thing, rather like the PCL3, doesn't hydrolyze. Again, a better option than using the organic solvents. And then that can be reacted with this cyanoethanol material to make this, which is a precursor, as you'll see in a moment, to <coughs> phosphoramide, phosphoramides, which are then used for uh, drugs. Rather like the case for the BASF process, we also get very good mass transfer in the ionic liquid compared with in the case of the uh, in, ca in the case of hexane, for example. When you do the reaction that we've got here, we add generally an extra base. The extra base then mops up some of this HCl that's produced. That dissolves okay in the ionic liquid, but it doesn't dissolve in hexane. In the hexane, you see a precipitate. In the ionic liquid, it remains relatively solution-like, and therefore, you can get much higher selectivities and use higher concentrations in the ionic liquids than you would do conventionally. You then just distill out your product from the ionic liquid. This is what you would like to be able to form overall. You'd like to be able to form these materials here. What you generally do in the ionic liquid case is you take PCL3, the right amount of PCL3, you take a one-to-one -one molar amount with, in this particular case, the, the amine. You then add in the amount that you require of the cyanoethanol, and then you add in the amount that you require of the phosphoramidite. And it's simply bang, 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 bang. One to one to one to one to one, you get the product you want. If you do that in the, in the organic solvents, you get a mess. To get it to work in the organic solvents, you need something like a 10 mole equivalent of the PCL3 there to be able to just give you your, your sequential addition. I'm going to skip through this now. Okay. <clears throat> That has now been looked at by Merck, and Merck have then commercialized this to be able to produce the materials of interest. But in this particular case, the ionic liquid gives you advantages in the sense that, you, you, that it's quicker, it's less wasteful, you don't require special precautions. In other words, you don't need dry atmospheres, you don't need to do it, you can do this on the open bench, and you can produce new products because you can do it uh, on materials that you can't conventionally do uh, with, uh, with, the, the ionic, with, the, with the organic solvents. And to give you some idea, this is a five-step process and you get 92% in the isolated yield in the ionic liquid, whereas you only get around about 40 to 50% in the organic solvent. And you have a separation process. In the last few minutes, I'll just talk a little bit about catalysis and then go on to, uh, go on to the application. So we've also been doing quite a bit of work on trying to use the ionic liquids or see whether the ionic liquids give you a benefit in terms of catalysis. Most of the, most of the work in the literature uses very good catalysts or good catalysts that are already good in organic solvents. If they're already good in an organic solvent and you try it in an ionic liquid, 99 times out of 100, it will be good in the ionic liquid as well. So what we chose was we chose a bad catalyst and we tried to make it better in the ionic liquid. Can we, can we have an added, added advantage? This is the reaction that we were doing. It's an enantioselective reaction. So an enantioselective Diels order reaction. We used a range of phosphine ligands on our platinum, and we did them both in dichloromethane, the conventional solvent, and in the ionic liquid, which in this case was emin bistriflamide. These reactions in the dichloromethane were taken after 24 hours. These were taken after five minutes. This is the conversion of the, to the Diels order product. This is not unusual. This has been known since about 2002. 
that Diels alder reactions will be, get strongly enhanced by the presence of an ionic liquid because you force the two molecules, the cyclopentadiene, in this case, and the methyl as the lidinone, um, together in the ionic liquid, which then gives you the coupling. What we were more interested in was whether or not it would give you an enhancement in the enantio selection. And what you get is you get, in this particular case, an enhancement from 60-odd percent to 90-odd percent. You can actually improve that even further to about 99 percent. And what the ionic liquid does is it stops the racemization of the phosphine-based catalyst. It stabilizes one chiral form of the, of the catalyst, which doesn't then allow you to have the poorer enantio selection that you can see in the dichloromethane in that particular case. So it gives you an added advantage. You can also use the uh, ionic liquid to be able to do the recycle. So what we did was we tethered the ligand that we were interested in, in this particular case, this box ligand, to the ionic liquid, and we ran the reaction 10 times. What you can see in the, um, it, what you can see in the, <coughs> in the dark lines here is the, uh, is the yield, and what you can see in the hatched lines is the enantio selection. So not really very much change in either the yield or the enantio selection. However, if you don't use the tag ligand, in other words, you take off this bit here and you just use this material here, the yield starts to drop off. And that's because now you can design both the ligand and the solvent, in other words, the catalyst and the solvent, if you design them together, you can actually then give yourself the, the best opportunity to be able to recycle your material. So ionic liquids have a good solvation range for compounds. They have low volatility. They have low flammability in the right circumstances. If you have them as droplets, perhaps not. They have a good liquid range, minus 15 degrees Celsius all the way up to 300 Celsius. That's much larger than you would do for conventional liquids, perhaps. They have tunable physical properties. I hadn't really gone through that, but of course, as you change the chain length, you can change its viscosity. As you change the anion, you will also change its density and viscosity as well. They have a wide electrochemical window. I don't have time to go through the bit that I was just about to on the gold, but they have a very wide electrochemical window. This means that they can uh, deposit metals that you wouldn't not conventionally be able to deposit, electric deposit them, and so on. Because you have an ionic solvent rather than a molecular solvent, the chemistry is nearly always different than what you would get in the conventional molecular solvent. The interactions are very different, not just the hydrogen bonding, not just the polarity, but also the fact you've got ions there makes it different. It's important to say that it's distinct. It's not always the case that it's better. We have lots of examples where ionic liquid reactions are terrible compared with organic solvents. So you have to tailor your ionic liquid to the process that you're interested in. They do have long-range structure as well. But of course, as we've shown, they can be toxic. They can be expensive, OK? There are some ionic liquids out there now that are reasonably cheap. Cytec, for example, will produce ionic liquids on a very large scale for uh, treatment of, uh, of, of, as flame retardants. So those materials can be used, but there's only a small amount of those very low-cost materials. Problem about industrial conservatism. Well, the problem is that they haven't really gone from the bench to the industry yet. Okay, BASF have a process. They have a number of processes. There's processes that the old Degussa company, Evenik now, used to now, now produce things with ionic liquids. There's a process that Eastman's had and shut down in 2004, but you can name them. The fact that you can name them says that there aren't that many. There's a bit of a concern about the separation of ionic liquids and the ionic liquid recycle. How much of the ionic liquid do you need to be able to recycle for a process to be economic? That's really very important. We've done, re we've done processes with, uh, the, with the petrochemical industry, where they require you to have 99.99% recycle of the ionic liquid on a crude oil separation process. So you're using multiple tons of crude oil. This is very tricky to, to try and achieve. But also the ionic liquid has got to be really, 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 really cheap there, because you're talking about 
very, very low cost margins in that particular case. So can you use them as add additives rather than solvents? I've given you a couple of examples already, but you can, I skipped over this one a little bit, you can use them as additives or very thin layers in terms of depositing them on porous material. This was a, an idea that Peter Vashishait had originally, where you can perhaps dissolve your catalyst on, a, on an ionic liquid which is supported on a, a porous network. This is the supported ionic liquid phase catalysis type. We can also not use an ionic liquid. You could use an ionic liquid-like material. In other words, you could use a, a polymer. So we already know that there are cation and anion exchange resins freely available. Can you use them as catalytic supports and get the same sorts of behavior as you would do with the, uh, with the, with the conventional ionic liquids? Well, these are some materials that we've synthesized. These are some, some materials that, of course, you can buy conventionally. The key thing here is that you normally get these systems with a chloride anion. But in this particular case, what we've done is we've exchanged it because we're going to do catalysis for the bistriflamide anion. This is the same reaction that we were doing before for the enantio selection. Again, it's that deals order reaction. What you see generally is you get very high enantio selections for copper-based catalysts in the ionic liquid compared with in the conventional solvents. So what we've got is 90% enantio selection for the ionic liquid ether mixes, which is fine, but if we, use the, if we use this particular ionic polymer, we can get up to 98% in antio selection. So not only do we have a material that is ionic liquid-like, in other words, it has an ionic environment, it looks a bit like the ionic liquid you can see here. It has the prolidinium cation here with the bistriflamide anion but you perform better, and it's much easier to separate. We don't have a liquid separation now. We have a solid liquid separation, which is much easier, of course. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about, which is some work that was done between John Holbury, uh, Peter Nockerman, Martin Atkins, and Ken Seddon, uh, along with Petronas, the Malaysian oil company, where they have been looking at the removal of mercury from gas reserves. So in, in, the, uh, in, in natural gas, you can get mercury poisoning or mercury in those systems. It causes embrittlement. It causes large plant failure, as you can see here. This is a plant that was, uh, that was uh, destroyed via mercury. And in that particular case, you got 27 people killed. So a conventional system is to use an activated carbon with either sulfur or potassium iodide on it. And you use this sort of processing here with these very large adsorber columns on it. The idea is to get the mercury levels down to less than 0.1 ppb. So the group did a generic ionic liquid screen. They identified and optimized the characteristics. They modeled the system, looked at the compatibility, and they went round this loop again and again until they got to the point where the performance of the ionic liquid was good. It had to have generic extraction for all mercury species. It doesn't, it should only be a retrofit to the existing plant, and the cost had to be cheaper than the current cost of the materials that were being used. They were the criteria. So again, they used a solid supported ionic liquid based system so this is the ionic liquid on activated carbon. This is the ionic liquid on porous silica. So how does it operate? This is the conventional material. So this is time on stream now with respect to the amount of mercury that you're seeing in the gas phase for laboratory results. This is the conventional material. And you can see after about 10 hours, you get breakthrough of the mercury. After 30 odd hours, you're getting breakthrough with the solid supported ionic liquid. So that gives you, it's saying it's about three to five times better in adsorbent than it was for the conventional system. But really, how does that work in, the, in reality? Well, the lab scale work was done over a period of about three years, then moved to pilot scale for a year, where the performance was about two to three times, 
and then it was put as a 15-ton charge into a mercury column or mercury removal column in Petronas. That's the chart, that's the people. So this is now days. This is the level at which you've got to be below. And this is now days of the charge of the material. So this has been now running for about six months. And so that has gone all the way through from laboratory scale to full scale production of this material and it's continually being improved. And that's now being commercialized by Petronas as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a material to, to be sold. So, where are we? Well, ionic liquids and green chemistry are not synonymous with each other. In other words, <coughs> if this is your Venn diagram, this is not where ionic liquids are. But ionic liquids do have a role to play. So the whole life cycle of the ionic liquids, the material balances, the re reactor materials, the energy considerations, everything from cradle to grave has to be considered, or cradle to cradle really, has to be considered with the ionic liquid processes, as does any other process. So ionic liquids are no different. They are now becoming more of a commodity chemical. They're now becoming materials that are used conventionally around the place. But they can't always be considered as green, not in terms of chemistry, not in terms of engineering. But they can in certain instances, as we've shown you. So it just leaves me to thank you for listening. Um, there's been a ton of people who I've mentioned a few as we've gone along, so I can't mention them all. Uh, so I do apologize for, for that. But um, these are the people who mainly have given the funding for the work that I've mentioned. And as I say, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for listening.